Stakes are high as China's President Xi Jinping makes his first state visit to the U.S. this week as we learn of yet another hack attack, this time on Apple's App Store in China. Is there hope of a cyber arms deal? This is Bloomberg West. I'm Emily Chang. Coming up, Alibaba shares down today as the company ends its lockup and down 32% since the IPO. What's Yahoo's next move? Plus, Apple drives ahead with its plans for an electric car, according to the Wall Street Journal. And Tesla investors are pumping the brakes. And Kickstarter is practicing what it preaches, reincorporating as a public benefit corporation, saying they never want to sell or go public. I'll speak with Kickstarter CEO and co-founder Nancy Strickler. All of that ahead on Bloomberg West. First, to our lead, China's President Xi Jinping is kicking off his first state visit to the U.S. with a stopover in Seattle this week. In a rare face-to-face, -face, top Chinese government leaders will meet with U.S. tech execs like Apple's Tim Cook, Microsoft's Satya Nadella, Amazon's Jeff Bezos. Yet tensions loom. President Obama has hinted at new sanctions on China over cyber attacks, while U.S. officials are looking to strike a potentially groundbreaking cyber arms deal. Joining me here in the studio, Brian White, COO of Red Owl Analytics and cybersecurity expert. With me from Stanford, GGV managing partner Glenn Solomon, an active investor in China. So, Glenn, we've been getting dribbles about what's actually going to happen at this meeting in Seattle for days now. We know more about who will be there in addition to the names I mentioned Bob Iger, Indra Nooyi. What do you think can actually be accomplished at a meeting like this? You know, I think, Emily, it's an indication of the interest amongst the tech uh, companies in Silicon Valley in China uh, that everybody who's anybody in technology is really going to be at this meeting. Um, I think the, the dialogue will be uh, somewhat substantive in that people are going to be given the opportunity to, to talk about their aspirations in China and develop relationships with uh, members of the government who are important in entering China. But I also think you'll see following this meeting more activity as we've already begun to see, whether it be from Uber or Airbnb. Uh, certainly Apple, now Google, more and more companies you'll, you'll continue to see enter the China market because it really is so attractive for them. At the same time, Brian, the hack attacks keep coming. This potential cyber arms agreement that we're hearing U.S. officials talk about uh, could potentially you know, prevent the Chinese or, or hinder the Chinese from hacking critical infrastructure, but it would have nothing to do with the theft of intellectual property, which seems to be the most serious concern right now. How optimistic are you about an agreement like this, and, and what would it actually accomplish? Yeah, I think first it's uh, fair to say that this is progress that they're even discussing cyber. It's not too long ago that this wouldn't have even made the agenda. Mm -hmm. Second, I think that what they're basically doing is an agreement to continue to negotiate. They're looking for some very early steps that indicate what they're willing to do. For example, China is perhaps going to say that they will not t attack critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we're going to put some rules in the road, basically some lanes about where fair play is. Because right now the key issue is that we have distinctions and differences on what is fair. We believe that you can engage in espionage for your uh, government purpose, but not for commercial. And that's where the distinction with China uh, remains. But why bother at all, Glenn, for example, if businesses right now are the ones that are the most vulnerable to hack attacks coming from China? Well, uh, I think when you, when you talk about cyber security and cyber attacks, you need to distinguish between state-sponsored activity uh, and commercial activity. So in the state-sponsored world, uh, it's fair to say that you know, governments all over the globe are uh, perpetrating uh, uh, cyber activity, uh, whether it be our government here in the U.S. or the Chinese government or you know, governments from, from all major regions of the world. Uh, you're seeing lots of state-sponsored activity underway, and you know there there are there are legitimate, uh, quote unquote, legitimate purposes, espionage, and 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 maybe there will be rules of the road that'll be established in agreements mm -hmm. like the one that hopefully will come from the the conversations underway between Xi and Obama, but um, then there's also you know commercial-oriented attacks, and I think. Uh, the, the attack uh, that Apple announced on its App Store uh, this weekend is a good example of probably commercial activity, uh, people okay. trying to get access to information for whatever reason they, they may see, uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, to get some profit out of it. 
Brian, I want to talk to you a little bit more about this Apple hack attack that we saw over the weekend, a first of its kind hack where they hacked the app store in China and specifically apps like WeChat, Didi Kwai, huge, huge apps uh, and Chinese companies, mm -hmm. no less. Um, what do you make of, of this happening? How significant is it? Well, first, we don't know who, who did it. Mm -hmm. But second, I think it's significant in what it demonstrates is that they were able to find a way in. And this one was quite uh, in, in, ingenious in that they had the ability to actually uh, demonstrate advertising that you could get an access of Xcode through Badoo. And they were able to convince people to go there because it's easier to access than, than via directly from Apple. And then when they loaded up these new apps into the Apple Store, Apple did not catch that these were running fraudulent code. And what the code was seeking to do was actually try to steal your credentials, gather information to take that, uh, those credentials and use them elsewhere. So I think it's significant, but you know, for, uh, the funny thing is it's not surprising anymore. We see these attacks over and over and over again, and I think it continues to demonstrate that nobody is secure here, and everybody needs to take some steps uh, that they may not think is necessary to check the code, do application whitelisting, put other techniques in place so that they can also be part of the solution. Now, obviously, you know, I mentioned Alibaba at the top. There are some broader concerns, Glenn, about what's going on in the Chinese markets and, and, and volatility that we're seeing there. Alibaba has not fared well since its IPO, and today uh, the lockup expired. You guys are an early Alibaba investor. How concerned are you about what's happening here, and what do you see as the long-term Alibaba growth story? Great question, Emily. I think, you know, in the short run, things like lockup expirations tend to hit companies uh, in, in terms of their stock price just because there's more supply that comes on the market. Uh, and as people anticipate that supply coming on, stocks tend to trade down. Actually, if you look back across many tech names, buying around this time is usually a pretty good thing to do. Stocks tend to react well in the, in the months ensuing uh, after lockup. And so you, you may see that Alibaba uh, has a rebound in the not too distant future. But longer term, you know, the story around Alibaba is really a story around uh, growth in the new economy in China. And as you know, at my firm, GGV Capital, we're very bullish on China, particularly the new economy within China. We think that there's really a, a dichotomy between old economy China, uh, the state-owned enterprise, uh, largely uh, inefficient uh, businesses where the stocks of those companies have tended not to do well on the local indices in China, contrasted with the new economy, the tech uh, companies and tech-enabled businesses in China that are really uh, uh, seeing the same thing going on in China that we see here, where software is eating the world, software is eating the U.S. in many uh, uh, traditional industries, and the same mm -hmm. things going on in China. So we're, we're bullish long-term on that, uh, uh, that continuing to be the case, and we think Alibaba is a beneficiary of that long-term as well. And quick last question, Glenn. Obviously, Yahoo is sitting on a huge stake, and there are some questions about how it would be taxed. But what do you think Yahoo's next move is here? We have 30 seconds. So, you know, look, Yahoo is uh, really a very interesting business. Uh, it's, it's, it's mostly a, a tracking stock for Alibaba these days. And because there's now some glimmer of hope that uh, Yah that Yahoo shareholders will be able to get access to that Alibaba stake, uh, perhaps in a more tax favorable way. You're seeing Yahoo react positively to that news. But I think long term, Yahoo is in a very difficult position with respect to their underlying business. Lots of execs have been leaving and thinking about leaving. I just don't see a great way out for Yahoo as a company, their stake in Alibaba notwithstanding. All right. Kathy Savitt uh, recently left Yahoo, uh, their former CMO. Glenn Solomon, partner at GGV, thanks so much for joining us. Brian White of Red Owl Analytics. We'll be watching to see how this meeting in Seattle progresses. Now, news just out that Scott Walker is quitting the presidential race, according to the New York Times. That could potentially help out another Republican candidate. A new CNN poll shows that former Hewlett Packard CEO Carly Fiorina has vaulted into second place with 15% of the vote. That is up from 3% in September. But her business record remains a serious sticking point. With Fiorina at the helm of HP, the company lost over half its value and 30,000 people were laid off. Fiorina disputes just how bad her tenure was and points to the support of Silicon Valley multi-millionaire venture capitalist Tom Perkins, who was on the board of HP during that time. Perkins took out a full-page ad in the New York Times to defend her record at HP, calling Fiorina an excellent CEO. But 
Is Tom Perkins really the guy Fiorina wants making the case for her to be president? You may remember him as the guy who compared the, quote, war on the 1% to the persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany last year. I spoke to him about that comparison. Let's take a listen. Let the rich do what the rich do, which is get richer. But along the way, they bring everybody else with them when the system is working. Now, you are a multimillionaire. No, I'm not a billionaire. I'm You're a multimillionaire. I said multimillionaire. I've, I've created some billionaires, but I unfortunately am not one. You have owned fancy yachts, yes. fancy cars, yes. and underwater submersible. Airplane. Do underwater you, airplane. I, I, I saw it. It's basically an airplane that flies underwater. Right. Do you worry at all that you are divorced from reality? Are you divorced from reality? I, I don't know if anybody can answer that. Uh, <laughs> Truthfully, I don't think so. They got into a discussion about the idiocy of Rolex watches and why does any man need a Rolex watch? And it's just a symbol of, of uh, terrible values and et cetera, et cetera. Well, <laughs> I think that's a little silly. Uh, this isn't a Rolex. I could buy a six pack of Rolexes for this, but so what? Tom Perkins there, big backer of Carly Fiorina. Coming up, Kickstarter is saying no to profit over people. The crowdfunder CEO tells us why he's refocusing his mission next. In the age of billion dollar plus valuations and splashy IPOs, it's rare to hear a founder say he never wants to sell his startup or go public. That is the case with Kickstarter. Over the weekend, the crowdfunding platform announced it was reincorporating as a public benefit corporation, a distinction that means the company is now legally bound to do good for the public. Joining me now to explain this move is Kickstarter co-founder and CEO Yancey Strickler with me from New York. Uh, Yancey, really interesting to hear you know, the, the way you guys made this decision. First of all, why are you doing this and how did you, how did you come to decide that you were indeed uh, going to reincorporate? Well, this is actually something we've been working towards from the very beginning. We, we were always very focused on building an organization uh, that reflected our, our ideals and was trying to chart its own course. Uh, a public benefit corporation didn't exist the way that it does now. We first started Kickstarter you know, six plus years ago. Uh, and so when Delaware passed a law in 2013 where a company could become a public benefit corporation, we were excited to take that step. And so we've drafted a charter that's available on our website today, Kickstarter slash charter that details the commitments we are making both to our community and the public. And for the most part, these things just reflect the way that we've always operated the company, trying to be very values driven and, and very idealistic. We have a new, uh, a new commitment we announced today of donating 5% of our annual post-tax profits in support of arts and music education and to organizations fighting inequality. But overall, we were excited to inscribe in the legal founding documents of the company, the sorts of things that we care about and the sort of company we want to continue to be. You know, there's so much talk of unicorns right now, and I wonder, what's your take on the, the path that all of these other companies are pursuing? Is it wrong to pursue a big, splashy IPO? And what should these companies be doing for the public good if they go the public route? No, I, I don't think that's wrong at all. I think as an entrepreneur, you just have to be aware from the very beginning what you're doing it for. You know, what is the goal for your organization? For us, it's been sustained long-term growth. You know, we want to be a service that's around for a very long time, and we've thought of ourselves as operating as if we were a public trust. And so we have the benefit of taking this step because uh, we have a revenue model. We've been a company that's operated in the black for the past five years, and we have shareholders and investors who are uh, deeply believe the things that we do. And so when you have that sort of alignment at the management and the investor level, you can make a choice like this. You can make a decision that uh, certainly costs the company potential profits, 
uh, but we believe is in the long term better interest. And so for you know an entrepreneur, it's just especially important that you and your investors have that kind of alignment where everyone knows exactly what the outcome you want is. And so yes, for some companies, that is an exit through a sale or an IPO, and that's traditionally what venture capital is looking for. But we always wanted to do it quite differently. And so we've been fortunate to have great investors like Union Square Ventures and Fred Wilson uh, who are aligned around the same, sort of, uh, the same sort of approach. You've also got Chris Saka, Jack Dorsey backing you guys. And I'm curious, how did they take this decision and how much convincing did it take to get them to a point where they were like, OK, we're behind you on this. Well, we've always been open about who we are, and uh, you know, I think that people have enjoyed that. I mean, Saka is someone that uh, we have great respect for, and, and vice versa. Um, you know, we put this. This was put out to a vote among the Kickstarter shareholders, which includes current and former employees and our investors, and there was not a single dissenting voice. This is very consistent with how we've always operated, and I think collectively we felt a sense of pride to be able to make this statement today and to so clearly communicate what it is that we stand for. Any concerns about how this could impact your recruiting? Uh, my expectation is that this will be very powerful for recruiting. I mean, this is a this is a framing we've given every uh, every person that we brought in when we've hired them to be very clear about our values and the way that we think about uh, the long-term prospects of the business. But I strongly believe that this is going to attract a certain sort of person to us. And so, you know, we are regularly bringing in high-quality talent, and we pay market salaries, and you know, we have a great team of just over a hundred here in New York City. Uh, and I think this is just going to be a boom for the sorts of candidates we're able to attract. And quickly, do you think there's anything more that other technology companies who may, maybe they don't go go for the PBC thing, um, but but what do you think other technology companies should be doing to give back to the community, to give back to the public? Well, I think really reflecting upon your operations and ensuring a consistency is very important. You know, you don't want to be professing one value uh, in one channel and actually doing something quite different elsewhere. Um, for people who are starting companies now, young entrepreneurs, I would consider them to con consider, I would encourage them to consider becoming a benefit corporation from the start. Uh, that way you're able to identify those values from the very beginning. You don't have a shareholder vote. and actually doesn't restrict you in any real ways. You're still a for-profit company. If we okay. had had the option to do that, you know, 10 years ago, we would have. Interesting stuff. Yancey Strickler, thank you so much for joining us today on Bloomberg West, Kickstarter co-founder and CEO. Thank you. Now, in today's edition of Drive, Apple taking on Tesla, the iPhone maker reportedly speeding up its plans to build an electric car and hopes to have them on the road in four years. This according to the Wall Street Journal, which says Apple spent over a year investigating options, including meeting with government officials in California. The company is reportedly tripling the 600-person team leading the project, codenamed Titan, and has been on a hiring spree. In recent months, Apple has signed on experts in automotive and battery technology. And while Apple's first electric vehicle probably won't be fully autonomous, a driverless car could still be in its future. Coming up, the virtual reality startup Jaunt gets a big vote of confidence from Disney. The CEO tells us his plans next. It is time now for the Daily Bite, one number that tells a whole lot. And today's number is 14. That is the number of any awards HBO took home last night, giving it the title of undisputed winner among the networks. Why is it important? Well, because streaming services from Netflix to Amazon have been trying to steal HBO's crown as a leader in premium original content. But a look at the scoreboard from last night's Emmy shows that HBO's dominance from a critic standpoint is still safe. The closest runner-up in terms of trophies was Comedy Central with four awards. Staying in media, the cinematic virtual reality startup Jaunt has just re raised an additional $65 million in funding led by Disney. The new cash brings Jaunt's total funding up to $100 million, giving it bragging rights as the most funded independent VR company to date. Joining me now to explain what he plans to do with the the money, Jaunt founder and CEO Jens Christensen. Great to have you back here on the show, Jens. So what do you plan to do with this money now yes. that the coffers are full? 
Well, basically, we're going to scale up operations. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of pieces to John. So we have John Studios based down in LA that uh, partners with the content creators. Uh, we have a hardware team that's built a John One camera that's a really advanced VR camera. And we do a lot of software, computational photography software and apps uh, where you can consume the content. Now, you, you've done some interesting things to leverage your relationship with Disney, VR news dis dispatches from Syria, for example. What else will we see there? Well, so uh, the, the first example was the Inside Syria uh, piece that we did where you can f actually find yourself on the rooftop of uh, Damascus. Now, going forward, uh, you know, we intend to do a lot of work uh, with our partners, uh, not just in news. Uh, we, we're very excited about storytelling. Uh, in general, uh, taking VR from being just an experiential uh, uh, experience, in, in essence, where you are, say, in a rooftop or inside a temple, to actually being part of a story and telling an entertaining story. And that's uh, why the strategic round is important uh, for us. So on that note of storytelling, what do you see as the biggest opportunity? Is it selling the hardware, selling the headset, or production, making original content? Well, there's going to be a whole ecosystem that's built up, and there are people who are going to sell headsets, uh, people who are going to sell cameras, people who are going to essentially provide content and monetize that. And uh, for us at Jaunt, the key is the content. Mm. Uh, we think as people really get the headsets, uh, they're going to want to go and explore. They're going to try games. They're going to want uh, cat videos <laughs> in VR, and they're, they're going to want high-end content. And where we fit in is really on the high-end side, delivering high-end content to consumers. So you've got Jaunt Studios. Oculus, for example, has Story Studio, how is your company and your technology different from what Oculus has to offer? Right, so the key of what we do is live action VR. We call it cinematic VR, and it's recorded with a camera as opposed to CG or animation. And uh, that's really one of the key differences. The other key difference is that we partner with the creative community. That is, we don't have uh, the creatives in-house, but we work with media companies, with independent film studios, with brands, with independent filmmakers to create content. And your hardware is, that's available to partners. Do you see making that commercially available? Uh, I think eventually will be. Right now it's very high-end, uh, mm -hmm. very expensive, uh, custom-made hardware that we're making it available to our partners. And quickly, when will VR be mainstream? I mean, how many years are we talking here? Oh, I think uh, maybe next year. As next, early year? As next year? Well, you're going to have tremendous headsets coming online. The HTC Vive, Facebook, Oculus, uh, Rift is coming online with their consumer versions. Uh, Sony PlayStation VR is coming. I mean, once all these headsets are in place, we think it's going to go mainstream. Wow. I'm going to hold you to that. All right. <laughs> John, John CEO, Jens Christensen, thanks so much for joining us today here. Thank you so much. On Bloomberg West. Hear that? Next year, VR, mainstream. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg West. Uh, tomorrow on the show will bring you the winner of this year's Google Science Fair. You do not want to miss it. More on that breaking news about Scott Walker coming up.